You are listening to Salty Believer Unscripted, a conversation on Christian ministry and the Christian life. This is Salty Believer Unscripted. I'm Josiah Walker. I'm Brian Catherman. And on today's episode, we're talking about the book of Revelation, oh, starting a new series today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's exciting. You know, Revelation can be a, a daunting book. And, uh, you know, many of our listeners know you and I pastor at a church together. Yep. And uh, we've actually started at our church a Friday night service uh, where you're preaching through the book of Revelation. Right. Kind of a winter thing. Everybody's yeah. hold up for the winter. Yep. Something to do. And we decided Revelation yeah. would be a good one to do. Yeah. Why not? Uh, you know, there's 66 books to choose from. Why not choose Revelation? Actually, we're getting a lot of people asking questions. Okay. It seems like this last couple of years, maybe since the pandemic, that's just been a lot of questions. We right. thought we need to deal with this. It's the whole counsel of God. Let's... Buckle your seatbelts, let's do it. Buckle up, here we go. So, along that same vein of, you know, people asking questions within our own church, we thought maybe our listeners here at Salty Believer Unscripted might have some questions, and it might be a book that you haven't really looked at much, and so we wanted to just kind of spend some time talking through how to study this book, how to read this book, how to teach this book, or preach this book, just we want to talk about this book. And here's some tools, and here's some, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I feel like it's an underappreciated, under known but over dramatized maybe oh yeah there you go you know, yep kind, kind of kind of text you know what else it's been a while on the podcast since we just dialed into scripture yeah you know we've done series in the long past about you know the hard hard texts of the bible or this thing or that thing or church like, yeah. we just need to be in a series for a while where we say let's just get anchored back yeah. into this forget all the stuff that's happening out there in the world for right. preachers and pastors and this that and the other let's just Let's use the Word of God to sort of be a, a place for us to anchor in that and then see some other tools to study the Word. And and it was this book or Song of Solomon. Those are the two spicy ones, right? And I didn't want to touch the other one in this podcast. <laughs> Out of the two, I, I guess I'm glad we, we picked this. So uh, I guess my first question, I'd like to ask some questions, Brian, and maybe you have some questions too. But yep, hit me. But what I'd like to start with is is why Revelation? Like you said, Revelation or Song of Solomon. But, but why Revelation? Uh, you talked a little bit about people having questions, but... What made you kind of want to dive into this book? Okay, so um, it's part of the Bible. Wait, one of the- is it Revelation or Revelations? Because I've grown up to hear both. What? Okay, so you, what did you used to hear in the church when you were a kid? Probably Revelations. You think the so? Most, you know. I don't think so. I'm going to say it this way, and this like people get all hot and de- you know they divide and they debate on everything. So it's probably another reason to divide and debate. But uh, a lot of Bible publishers of a lot of the translations will go with Revelation as a single thing. Okay. Like this is the revealed book that was given to John, and it went as one single unit right. to the churches. Uh, you know, they didn't just send a little, one letter this way and one letter that way in the little right. parts. They sent sure. the whole thing to the churches. We okay. have it as one whole unit. Yeah. Um, there are people that say, well, there's lots, there's a few, a handful, two or three or four, whatever, yeah. whatever position you take when you structure the book. Where John's getting these different visions, yeah. plural, there's multiple visions, and therefore they want to call the book Revelations yeah. because it has different visions. But I I would prefer, in my preference, to say this, um, multiple visions, I agree with that, plural visions, right. but a single revelation. I actually think the whole Bible is a single revelation. It's the revelation right. of God to creation. And also... Just sort of on a, on a, in a technical term, we don't have titles. The books were not titled for the most part when they were originally written. Um, most of these books, they're titled after the first word in the book or the first sentence in the book so that we knew what they were, but they didn't come with titles. Yeah. And so I have, I have different titles here. I'm looking at, uh, I'm looking at my, my Greek Bible as the Revelation to John, but sure. the very beginning line yeah. The beginning line starts with the very first word is front loaded and it's it's basically in English it's revelation uh of Jesus Christ or uh I mean it's that's kind of yeah. how it's opening. So it's not right. even just a revelation to John. I'd say it's right. it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Okay. And so I like to hold to Revelation, the I book of some, Revelation, the revelation of Christ, and the revelations. Yeah, yeah I hear people say it, but I it's not some, my preference. I think some preachers just put a lot of pizzazz when they're preaching. You know, for the revelations. Uh, they get really excited like, about it. They add on it. Yeah. So revelation. So okay. So, uh, so why revelation? There, that was the question. Okay. So uh, why preach it? Well, it's part of our sixty-six books. Yeah. Um, and if we're going to preach the Bible and we want to preach the whole counsel of God, then we should definitely be preaching from the 66 books, which is ironic because I see people that will will literally take other things, 
preach things that aren't even from the 66 books, but they'll sure. avoid this book. Right. Let's. I mean, I, I've recently seen and listened to somebody preach through uh, the Nicene Creed yeah. or uh, the Baptist Faith and Message or whatever, or this is a book. Hey, we really like this book. I, just take yeah. from the 66 right. books and go for, for it, sure. right? So it's in our canon. It's always a safe one. bet to go with Scripture. Number two, uh, the way it opens, I think, gives us an encouragement and a promise. It says... Uh, I'm just going to, the revelation of Jesus, well, I'm reading from the CSB, of Jesus Christ that God gave to him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angels to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever else he saw. Now, here we go. Verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it. Because the time is near. So if we don't know what's in this book, yeah. if we avoid it, yeah. if, we, if the church never hears it preached, then we're missing out on this blessing to keep it and to obey the words of it and to understand it. That's number two, that there's okay. a promise in it that we're blessed by going through it. Uh, number three is the purpose of the book. The purpose of the book is is helping people to follow Christ, but I, I think there's a theme throughout the whole thing that it is providing comfort, it is providing hope, it is providing guidance, and so the outcome of the book should produce people, Christians, who are n not anxious about the things that are happening in the end times, that are trusting in God's sovereignty, that are seeing how all this plays out from beginning to end, uh, and so I think, I think in a time when Christians are all just freaking out, this right. might be a good book to turn to because they were all in difficult times. The first audience was in very difficult times and persecution, and this was supposed to keep them from freaking out, not cause them to freak out. Okay, I want let's let's dive into that a little deeper because you made an interesting statement where you said people should find comfort in this book. And when I think of a book I want to find comfort in, I think of like the Psalms, right? I never go to Revelation because I feel like in Revelation, the church is divided. Either they're all about this book and they just consume it and they spend 95% of their time reading this one book of the Bible, or they just avoid it completely. And I feel like both of those parties have their point of view with Revelation centered around anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, I've never wanted to read this book much. I've, I've read it a couple times, you know, in my Bible in a year reading plan, but I've never been one to want to study it all because I'm afraid of it. Like, it scares me. I, I think we don't, I think why it's scary is the same reason why when I was a little kid, my dad's chainsaw was scary. Okay. okay my, when I was a little kid, I didn't understand really how the chainsaw worked. Uh, it made a lot of noise. It, you know, cut stuff and did stuff and you had to wear goggles and but now that I am an adult and I've used a chainsaw and I understand how valuable this tool is, how wonderful it is, I understand it, now I greatly appreciate it. And to be honest, I like my chainsaw. When I have to do some heavy lifting, right. some big some big log cutting, chainsaw is the way to go. Now you understand how it's used, what it's used Correct. for, and how so to I safely operate I it. I think our fears come from not understanding the tools we should be deploying when we read this book. Okay. Uh, same tools we use in lots of other places in scripture. Yeah. I think our fears are we don't understand the apocalyptic type literature. So sure. it's the same thing with Daniel. Oh, that's weird. That's bizarre. Not the first part, but the second part. Yeah. Same thing with the weird visions in Ezekiel. How does this work? I think we don't understand how poetic imagery and apocalyptic imagery works. So yeah. We try to read it like an epistle, like the same way you'd read Romans maybe. And that causes us to get all you know, spun out of control and afraid. And so I think once we have a better understanding of it, it's a little bit easier to, to, to take on and read and, and see what's there. But because we're all afraid of it, sure. or we're all super yeah. enamored with it like yeah. some kind of idol, we're not actually looking at how to do it. Right. I'll, I'll give you a different example. We've talked on this podcast about the Four Views books. Sure. And yeah. if you open a Four Views book on page one and you try to read it, you end up somewhat overwhelmed. Yeah. But if you if someone helps you, and I, they should they probably include this in the right. inside, but when, when a professor came to me and said, here's how you read one of these books. Yeah. There's four different views, and then after every view, all the authors write rebuttals to that person's view, and it's just a right. giant book full of debate. Yeah. But he said, start with the view you're closest to, read it. Then don't read the responses, don't read the right. debates, don't get, don't get lost in the sauce. Right. Go to the next argument closest to yours, read it, work your way out until you've read all four arguments. Yeah. Now you've been thinking about the arguments and you've been working. Then go back and read how each of the authors responded and then go back. So you sure. have tools 
right. to handle that book. I don't think the church gives good tools very often because we don't ever preach through this. That's probably a fair statement. I, I don't remember, I maybe once or twice growing up, that this book has ever been preached at, at the churches I've been a part of. I, I think a lot of times, like I said, we either shy away from it or like we're, we're preaching it every year. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. So, or, or we do what I've done, I admit. I went through those seven letters. Y'all, you constantly see, oh, the seven letters, which, you know, even that, the way we do it sometimes is without tools, but it feels like it's on safer ground, sure. sort of like we do with the first part of Daniel. We're going to do this part of Daniel, but not, not the, the other, other stuff. So that <laughs> kind of leads into my next question is, uh, this book seems challenging to me. Are there are there challenges to preaching this book, or is it just that we don't understand it do you and it's want, actually smooth sailing? Do you want to preach the book? No. I, is I it because you see that there's challenges? <laughs> <laughs> there's huge challenges. Well, it's mostly it's because I've only read it like twice. Um, but but no, I, I think there are there, there are some serious challenges to this book. I think one you've already highlighted. We don't have the tools, and so maybe that's something on this podcast we spend a few weeks kind of talking about yeah. different tools. I want to make sure we're sharing the this tools. book. Yep. Um, but more than that, I think there's challenges in that, like like you already mentioned too. Like there's multiple views. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. How do you preach a book that there's multiple views on? Are you going to land on a view? Are you okay. going to preach all the views? Uh, <laughs> so okay, none of the views. You've asked a few questions that probably all deserve to be answered, <laughs> and and this creates one of the challenges. There's lots of opinions. There's lots of views. There's lots of ways to approach this. Yes, and I'll come back to that in just a second. Your question on are you going to land on a view? Uh, originally I was approaching this thinking, I think I'll just provide the wide array that people sure. have seen this yeah. and then let the hearer decide. But I was recently... That does seem safer. It feels very safer. <laughs> and I could do that. I, could, I mean, it feels yeah. very much like the academic hat sure. put this on, except I was really convicted at the Charles Simeon workshop we went to. Not about this particular text, but just about this in general. You're the one preaching. You're heralding right. the word. You should be able to, st I mean, unless you legitimately don't know, you should be able to proclaim what you're heralding and take right. a stand on it because you're standing on the word of God and the truth of God. Okay. So I'm going to, for the most part, unless I completely can't figure it out and don't know, I have a view. I have a position. I'm going to preach from that conviction. I am going to say, hey, there's this conviction over here, but I am not going to hide behind here's all the different views sure. you decide. If I was teaching a class in a, in a seminary, sure. Okay. But I'm preaching from the pulpit. But with that, you run the risk of people like turning it off. Because I know people that like, if you don't hold to their view, they're not going to listen to you. Man, I've... <laughs> so... You know, it's funny when pastors are looking for jobs and stuff, there are some churches that will literally put how they expect sure. end times to be preached and what they want in right. this way, and you better conform to what we want. But I want to conform to what the book is telling us. Okay. Right? So I... I mean, we've already started preaching through it, and I have already started learning so much myself right. as I'm actually doing the hard work, using the tools, <clears throat> and going, oh, this is helpful, and oh, that's helpful. That's been really great. Well, and that's an intriguing statement, too, because you mentioned just briefly, you've preached the seven letters before. Yeah. And you're preaching them again now. Yeah. Are you preaching them differently? Yeah. Are you just pulling out the old manuscript no. and going with what you've already no, preached? No, 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 no. It's been so hard because when I... Uh, when I started down the road of chapter 2, which is where the letters are, I was shocked when I realized all these letters are actually a one letter. We The churches receive all the letters. We receive all the letters. The whole thing fits together, and the way that it works is that every letter is for every church, right. and it's all giving a little piece here and a little piece there. And I went, oh, that is not how I preached that yeah. before. I mean, I... I didn't look at the larger context of all the letters together. I just opened to the next letter. Here's what's going on. Preached a couple spicy things out of that letter. Applied it and missed the overarching controlling narrative of the whole chapter 2 and 3 and all ties to chapter 1. And so, yeah, I'm, I, I don't want people to go back and find those old sermons don't they're look available <laughs> they're available we and I'll just, we'll weep <laughs> over them and so so you're of the opinion of just always learning always kind of looking again re-examining yeah. you don't just say well I've, I've studied this in seminary i'll just go with what i learned in seminary. no i'm actually i'm actually learning that pulling out my old manuscripts sets me on a course that i might not want to go on okay. and so i've really been working through the process of doing the hard work what is the yeah. structure here and what do i see here and and how I'm not even going to commentaries at this point at all, and unless I am completely and absolutely stuck, and then I only go to look for a particular issue. So, for example, like 
I need to learn a little bit more about Smyrna. What's Smyrna yeah. like, and where is Smyrna? So I look at it in an atlas, sure. and then I look at it in an encyclopedia, in a dictionary, and then maybe I say, hey, what are these other commentaries maybe say specifically about Smyrna? But I'm trying really hard to do the work ahead of time. And then if I do well, pull out any commentary, it's just to do some check work. And I want to kind of ask about commentaries, because I feel like that's everyone's kind of go-to question. I get asked that question sometimes. Hey, what's the best commentary here? What's the best commentary there? And, I mean, you've... You've been in ministry for what, fifteen years? You know, fifteen plus. Yeah. You, you've been a lead pastor for ten. Um, I feel like it's easy to say, well, you've been in ministry a long time. You've gone to seminary. Maybe you don't need commentaries. But I feel like maybe for somebody who's who's never preached or is new in their faith, like that's the go to, right? You look to the commentaries. No, no, no. They shouldn't. If you're new in the faith and you're trying to do a Bible study, you should not go to the commentary for starting. Okay. So what I'm doing is like, so I've got a process. I'm using that Charles Simeon Trust Worksheet. Right. It, it actually really kept me dialed in to do the tools, to do the work that the commentary writers are doing. And I'm saying, okay, what is the structure here? Do I see it? And I'm spending the hard work. I'm praying and saying, okay, I want to, and I'm reading and rereading and rereading. And then I'm applying the tools from like the Charles Simeon online courses, from other seminary things I've learned from other books, but I'm not, I'm, I'm applying the Bible study tools. We did a, we right. did a class at church called Dig deeper, and I right. think that's the title of the book. Dig deeper, and you can learn Bible study tools or uh, living by the book by Howard Hendricks. Like you, yeah. you learn how to study the Bible, and then I do that. And so my process is structure, and then context pieces, and then where do I see the the argument, or what's the point that's being made, and then where do I see the gospel, and then I'm doing that, right? Okay. I'm doing those pieces, and it's when I get in that, and I'm dogged in that, and I can't find the answers that I might turn for some help. But I'm doing that first so that I'm not swayed by all the fire hose treatment of the commentary. Gotcha. And none of these commentaries are all in disagreement well, with each other. They're all over the map. That's why I wanted to ask because it's one thing. Like I, I've gone to websites, you know, I think it's bestcommentaries.com. And usually you can pick a book like Colossians, you know, and get the top three commentaries in that section. But I've been trying to pick a commentary in Revelation. And, man, it's all over the place. It's technical, semi-technical, the, the different four views on the apocalyptic. like Yeah, it's <laughs> it's hard. I didn't know what to pick. Which you asked so. about that. You asked about the different views. And so I want to I wanna go to this thing that might be really helpful for people. And, yes, this is a commentary, but it's a really helpful understanding of, of at least where to start. So if you own an ESV study Bible which I've pulled mine out, and I haven't seen this elsewhere. I mean, a lot of people make these arguments, but the, the ESV folks did a really good job of this. They have, in the section on the introduction to Revelation, they have a, a, a little subsection called Schools of Interpretation. Okay. And I like this because it's not just premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. It's actually, what is the camp? What is the right. school that comes to some of these positions? And the four, the four approaches they're talking about are the... The uh, historicist school, right? Uh, the futurist school, the um, I guess it's futurist historical premillennialism and futurist dispensational premillennialism. So that kind of divides into two, and then actually I'm kind of so historicist futurist. I guess it does divide into the preterist or preterism which everything kind of happened already in the past, and right. then idealism. And so if you read through these, they also have these really great graphs for what we're seeing and how the structure breaks down. And it's incredibly helpful to think through, and you don't go, well, which one do I like the most? You right. say, how do I understand? I don't think any of them are spot on, spot on. I think right. that the preterist one, I don't hold that view that everything happened in the, the past and it's done. But it, this understanding the foundation helps you understand how these people are going to wield these particular tools. Gotcha. Okay, so if you have if you have the old tow truck driver and he's got the uh, the what's the plumber wrench that's got like the really sharp teeth oh, yeah. and the little thing like and, a pipe wrench. Like a pipe wrench. He's yeah. got a pipe wrench in his tow truck. Right. And that pipe wrench can function with like it can do some leverage. It sure. can work like a hammer. Yeah. It can work like whatever and he's okay with that right. because he just came up he's in the school of yeah. I, I wield this tool how I wield this tool. Right. You might have another guy, though, that like every tool has an exact precise sure. job. They've got it cut out in the drawers of they, their chest. 100%. <laughs> everything's labeled. Yeah. And so he's going to wield the tool to do yeah. the job a little bit differently. And so some of these schools are not only just taking an approach of what is, what am I looking at? It's how they're deploying the tools yeah. to get to the views they get to. Right. 
which is really helpful. Um, you know, the historicist will look and say, how many of these things really maybe have played out? Are we seeing a whole picture of the gospel? Right. Is this Are these different visions showing us different overlapping things? Do they parallel as some of this stuff you know, happened? Because it actually happened in eternity past, and it happened in right. the Garden of Eden. Um, in the futurist view, there's all this, you know, a lot of this is all end times, last yeah. seven years or whatever, futuristic whatevers. That preterist is all this already happened before the destruction of the temple or somewhere in that ballpark. And that's and then then it just draws into a couple things right. of the second coming. And then uh, and then what was it? The idealism and I I uh, I read through this a little bit. It's more of a symbolic trying to grab onto yeah. some some not I mean there's a lot of symbolism. So sure. all of them go to symbolic things. But the whole thing is pointing to less specifics yeah. and more general things that cause us to think certain ways. So, so you go, oh, well, if that's how you approach it, then you're going to use the tools differently. That's so helpful. And, and that's in the ESV study Bible that yes. you're looking at right now. And the now. one I have, the, leather, the one I have here is a leather-bound one, and it's on, what, page 2,456 at the end. It, but the chart, I mean, if you look, you yeah. can see, they can't see, but if you look at sure. the chart, you're like, oh, that's no. giving you some time. So it, this happened in the first century, chapters 1 through 3, chapters 4 through 19. This is in the historicist view. This happened in the church age, and then the very end when you get to chapters 21 through 6, and then the last part in the dragon, that's all in the second coming. But then in the other view, this happens, chapters 1 through 3 happen in the first century, 4 through 9 pretty much all happens in the tribulation, Um, and then the last part's Christ's millennial reign, chapters 20, like it's just showing you kind of where these things land, which is interesting because if you go to, so here's sort of a modified version of the premillennial dispensational right. view, but what's really interesting is when you go to, when you go to the preterist view, all okay. So one through three, first century chapters four through eleven, the fall of of the temple in seventy right. A.D. Uh, chapters twelve through nineteen, Rome's fall in the fourth century. And then you finally get to twenty; it's the millennium. And then I mean, so right. you just you see how well, they're taking this. And I just appreciate that they're kind of going into some detail because I hated early on in my Christian journey as a young adult when people would ask me, "Oh, are you amillennial or dispensationalist?" And, and I didn't know how to answer them. I was like, "Well, my grandma's a Baptist and my dad's a Pentecostal. Does that make me a preterist? <laughs> like, I don't know." <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, so I just appreciate. I feel like when you have like a quarter of a s- semester of s- seminary, or you've read a book, you just use these five dollar words that maybe a lot of people don't know. Right. So I, I hope that maybe as we're kind of going along, you said in your preaching, you're going to really speak to one view, but maybe on our podcast, we can speak to these the well, four views as I we think go. Even and, in the preaching, I'll say, well, and I've done this already yeah. in some of those sermons. You know, there are some who see it this way, and there's some who see it this other way, and right. if it's this way, that would mean this. And if it's this other way, that would mean this. And I think that the scripture best shows us that it's this other way. Right. And here's why. Or, hey, both these views actually get us to the same point. Right. Or neither of these views. Like, I, But I'm going to actually try to, if I can, take a stand and go, this is where I lean and this is where I right. stand. I'll probably do that in the podcast, but I might not. <laughs> if I'm not required well, to, maybe I'll take the safe road. Right? <laughs> we'll see how that goes in future episodes. As we kind of wrap up kind of this introduction episode, I guess kind of one of my last questions would just be, why preach this book? Why did you choose to do this in like a preaching format versus like a teaching format uh, where people could ask questions and have some dialogue? That's a really good question. Uh, so I made the choice to herald the word, take that section, and and proclaim it, preach it, because I believe the word needs to be preached and heralded and, and people should be called to respond. That's all, That all comes in preaching. You can do a class and there's no call to response of any kind at all. Okay. Hey, that's interesting information. I stuck it in my head. Preaching should go from the head to the heart to the hands. There, there's a lot there. The, the understanding, the, the owning and, and having the effectual change of of thoughts and ideas and then actually having it play out and how we function, yeah. right? But also, um, when you try to teach a class in some of this stuff, people come in defending their preconceived ideas, the one way they've ever heard it, or their left behind books, or the guru that they love, or yeah. and then they want to argue it with everybody else, and they don't want to just Listen, so a lot of times when you're in a classroom setting, sometimes it it legitimately becomes people almost combating Right. What you're saying, and so what we're doing at Redeeming Life Church is we're the letters. So the first chapters one through three. Yeah. We we're preaching Friday night. Yep. Right. And we're already into that. We're deep into sure. that. But then it's coming on to warmer weather. That was just a temporary deal. So yeah. after 
after that ends and after Easter, we're going to pick it up in a in our Sunday morning class setting, except I'm going to preach about a 30, 35 minute sermon. Okay. And then I'm going to have some questions to help people, but we're going to break into smaller groups. I think you're going to have the youth join yeah. us and stuff too. Yeah. So you break into the smaller groups so that you can have a discussion in a smaller setting. But you know what? I'm totally okay. If there if there's a group of folks that want to take it from a certain perspective, yeah. here's some of our whatever, right? They, sure. they see it this way. They love yeah. this. Put them in the same group so they're so they not can, just fighting right. each other and they're not yes. trying to argue their position, but they can actually talk through what we just saw. Because it, obviously these people care. They're committed to this view. They held that view for a reason. But that can be come overwhelming to the new Christian who's trying to read this book for the Absolutely. first time. Absolutely. And they're like, what are they fi- I don't even know what we're fighting about. What are we talking about? <laughs> yeah. And, and then we can put some of the people in those groups sure. and then the other people can be in groups. And then if I need to... Maybe try to answer some questions. I can just do it in the things. group. Nice. And so I'm trying to I'm trying to find the best way that we can really receive the blessing of doing this yeah. in a way that's that's fruitful and rewarding. But at the end of the day, I think the Bible's intended to be preached. Right. And it's interesting to put a lot of information in our head, but preaching calls and demands for a response. And so okay. I think this book we we've gotten too comfortable sure. setting back, going, here's the fact, here's the fact, here's the right. fact. And we haven't said, what does this book call us sure. to do in this section of this scripture well and what to, your, it called, the to your point i've said this before i'll say it a hundred times i've read more books about the bible than the bible i spent a lot of my time <laughs> reading more books about the bible than the bible but when you actually sit down and read the bible you realize some of those guys got it wrong like it's better yeah. to just kind of look at this book maybe look at it with a new set of eyes or you know without your preconceived view yeah you know yeah yeah, yeah. and we're out of time but imagine for a minute the letter shows up at the church right okay the church of Thyatira, they're going to Ephesus. You're you're a member of the church in Ephesus, and this letter shows up from John, who we know went off to this prison island. Wow, and it's like a it's an epistle. Technically, this is kind of like an epistle, but it's it's apostolic literature. And, and literally on a Sunday morning, or you know, we're gonna read. Someone's gonna stand up and read this thing from start to finish. Yeah. Right. Or we're gonna read it in parts, and we might not have yeah. time. Wow. They're not going. Hey. Uh, I got John's letter, but I just went to the commentaries, and then I just went to this, and then <laughs> right. we just went to that position. We, so how did they process all this That's without all of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want us to try to go, okay, God intended for this to, to sink in and to do something. Let's see how this is going to yeah. go, right? Well, so there you have it. Maybe you've read this book a hundred times. Maybe you've read it once. Uh, either maybe way, you've never read maybe it. you've never read it. I invite you to come along with us on this journey as we kind of unpack this book, look yeah. at tools on how to study this can book. I, I want to offer a challenge too. Go read the book. Sure. We're going to go through it. You know, I mean, I don't know how long the podcast here is going to go. But we're going to take some pretty good sized chunks. Yeah. I don't think we're going to dive down into some of the little minutia everywhere. But man, go read it. And then when you're done, put it aside for a day or two, read it again. Ooh, Try seeing if you can do it in one setting. Okay. Maybe listen to it, because sometimes you, there Have are you so, read this in one setting? Yeah, I How did. long did it take you? Uh, I didn't take that long. It did, uh, what is it, 20 chapters? It took like, it takes me about, I, I usually read about I mean, Did four you read ch- this in an afternoon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. I, I usually have about four, three to four chapters in 15 to 20 minutes, because okay. I do that every day. Sure, sure. Uh, and so this is 20 chapters. All right. And so you're, you know, you're looking so, at a couple hours. And so as we, as we close out, you wouldn't say there's no reason somebody wouldn't read this book. No, you don't should, have to wait because it's the last book and read no, all no, the other to- No, they should totally go read it, even if they don't know. And here's the thing. Recognize you're reading uh, an artsy. Imagine you just went to an artsy independent film yeah. at the little local artsy theater. right? It's going to have some weird scenes. It's going to have some weird stuff. And it's communicating big ideas through weird scenes. Yeah. But you're going to see, if you do it in one setting, you're going to see a lot of the same patterns. Right. Seven comes up everywhere, right? And yeah. some certain patterns come up everywhere. And we don't want to read too much code into it. We just want to recognize these are sort of the themes and the patterns. And it's helping us to feel something, yeah. experience something. And so that's my encouragement. I think right. that'll help you as no. we go through this series. I think that's good. Maybe you're a postman and you don't know if you're post mail or not. Take some time, <laughs> read this book, take a couple days off, read it again, and then join us as we journey through this together. You want to share the email if they have questions? Yeah, if you have any questions, you can contact us at saltybeliever at gmail.com or drop us a line on our website, saltybeliever.com as well. Uh, until next time, remember these words. I'll leave you with this from Revelation 1. Blessed is the one who reads aloud these words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it because the time is near. Thanks for listening. Salty Believer Unscripted is a production of saltybeliever.com. Visit the website to find more resources like the podcast you've just listened to.